Hello, my brother, and welcome to the Great Man Within podcast. Every episode designed to help you discover and live the great man within you. You know, one of the funny things about running a podcast is you really have no idea which episodes are going to catch fire and which ones aren't. You know, there are times where I'll sit down to record a solo episode or I'll sit down with Brian. I'll be like, this is the episode that our audience has been waiting their entire lives for. And then we'll release it and we'll hear very little. Sometimes it's crickets. And then there's other times where I'll sit down at this microphone and I'll be like, I have no idea if there's a single person who will listen to this episode who has any idea what I'm talking about. And then those are the ones that seem sometimes to just do the absolute best. You know, a recent example of that was I sat down and recorded an episode called It's Time to Get More Curious About Your Father. And it was really me just sitting down at this mic after coming back from a, you know, a three-day weekend that I took my father up to the Catskills so that we could work on our relationship. He's 76, year old, 76 years old, just retired last year. The transition hasn't been an easy one as for a lot of men who have worked their entire lives and now are trying to figure out what to do with their time, what their identity is. And I came back and I just, I recorded um, kind of like a, you know, planting a seed to say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe it's time to get more curious about what goes on in the mind and heart of your father, whether he is still alive, whether he has ever been a part of your life, whether he's in your life in, in a certain way right now, where maybe you've pigeonholed him into one way of thinking about him, or like you've seen all that there is to see and there's nothing else that you've yet to uncover. And I found that um, so many of you resonated with that, no matter what your relationship with your father was. So I just wanted to thank you for reaching out and letting me know, because I think we're going to end up doing another episode um, entitled something along the lines of five questions to ask your father to get to know him better. And that was an idea that came to us from one of our listeners, Joel Buckner, whose whose voice you've heard on on this podcast recently. Um, So when you reach out to me and let me know what's resonating with you, it absolutely helps to shape uh, the direction of our future content. So please continue to do so at Dominic at DominicQ.com or come through DoInnerWork.com. There's places there you can reach out. So today we're having a conversation about how to change an adversary's mind. Now, this is a really timely conversation to have because we are living in an increasingly polarized world where people are putting their stakes in the ground. They're yelling and screaming at one another and no one's hearing each other, right? And as we are deep in this racial revolution where many of our listeners, many of you men are waking up to the idea of there's more I can be doing, better conversations I can be having, but we can get triggered so easily by someone who we deem as ignorant or someone who we deem as combative, someone who doesn't hold the same worldview as us. And we try to convince them. We try to tell them where they're wrong. We try to expose the flaws in their arguments. And usually what ends up happening is that person ends up walking away pissed. So do you. And there's no change. And so I started to think about one of the most impactful interviews that I've ever done on this show. And it was One of our earlier episodes, it was a three-part series, an interview that I did with one of my heroes, Daryl Davis. Now, you've heard me talk about Daryl quite a bit on the show. If you don't know him, Daryl Davis is a black man who has gotten over 200 members of the KKK to give up their robes and their hoods, their hatred and their ideology, and even just as impressively, to say goodbye to their communities. Like, do you understand how big of a deal that is to say goodbye to an entire community that may be your entire life? Like one of, one of the men that Daryl Davis was able to influence was a man by the name of Roger Kelly, who was the grand wizard of the Maryland chapter of the KKK. Like that's the top dog in that branch, right? So not only just a le- not only a leader of that community, but like the community pillar himself. And when you leave the KKK, like you're saying goodbye to all of those people. Like you've burned those bridges. The idea that one man, Daryl Davis, a man that Roger Kelly at one point in time would have wanted to exterminate from the face of the earth, has been able to influence that man, not only at a little level, but like on the most dramatic of levels to go to a 180 degree turn and give up so much in his life. And that became fascinating to me to understand 
how does this man have such a superpower to take someone at the extreme polar opposite of the spectrum and get him to change his mind, right? Because think about how hard it is for us to influence our children, for us to influence someone at work to do something differently, to influence our partner, our spouse, let alone someone who's like your deepest, darkest adversary. And Daryl Davis has done this. So if getting 200 members of the KKK to give up their robes, their hoods, their ideology, their hatred is not a superpower, then I really don't know what is. And so when I sat down with him back in, I think it was March of 2019, and there's three episodes that I recorded with him. You can go back and listen to them. Many of our audience members are listening to those episodes this week because it's just his, his conversation is more pertinent now than ever. Those are entitled, I think, Daryl Davis, the black man who tends KKK rallies. And I think those were released in March of 2019. I'll link them in the show notes. so You can just find them and easily click them. Now, I thought it was really relevant to go back and revisit what I learned from Daryl because as we are entering the stage, we're going to have more confrontational conversations with people that we either deem as adversaries or maybe just people in our lives that don't hold the same opinion as us. And his approach, which I've been able to break down, has shown remarkable results. Now, Daryl's game that he plays is a long one, right? Like first and foremost, you need to understand that getting someone like Roger Kelly to give up his ideology doesn't happen overnight, right? Daryl had to commit much time, much energy, many conversations, hearing things that he didn't want to hear, feeling things he didn't want to feel. But Daryl was committed to the long game and he was able to change his mind in the most dramatic of ways. So I've broken down five things, really kind of like a blueprint for Daryl Davis. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a simplified list. So you can just kind of sink your teeth into How does someone go and sit down across from a human being who may have murdered other people that look like you, who want you wiped off the face of the earth, and then over the course of time get you to change everything, right? So this is like an extreme example, but there are many of these pillars that we can use that I have begun to use in my conversations with people people around race, particularly. I've used this in all areas of my life too, any disagreements but especially when it comes to these polarizing conversations right now around race and religion and politics. And I don't think this stuff is going anywhere anytime soon. So learning Daryl's skills, these five steps that I've unpacked as his blueprint to changing an adversary's mind. And by the way, I think one more point before I go into the five blueprint steps, I don't think you can ever really start from a place of, I'm going to go in and change your mind. Like coming from that place, I think is one of the things that causes us to fail, right? It's like, I believe you're wrong. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to prove you wrong. And that energy is what pushes someone further, for like further entrenched into their own position. There's something else here where we need to start. And Daryl Davis teaches us how. So let me tell you step number one. Step number one in Daryl's approach is curiosity. He sits down at a table with a deep sense of curiousness. Like he leads with curiosity because the one question that has ruled his life from childhood is how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And if you know part of Daryl's story, like he grew up, his father um, was a diplomat. Daryl grew up in foreign countries with other diplomats, kids. So you're talking, you know, very racially diverse, all different colors, all different religions, and nothing like that was all normal for him until the age of 10 when his father then was moved and stationed in Boston, Massachusetts, or somewhere in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts, where Daryl was a Boy Scout, only black Boy Scout, was marching, and then had like rocks and soda cans thrown at him. And that was the day his family had to teach him racism, like what that was. And he had never experienced it in his life up until 10 years of age, and that makes him unique. But it made him curious more so than angry. And he was just like, how the hell could you hate me for my color? Because I've lived 10 years of my life, the most formative years of my life, somewhere else, right? Like with a different kind of life experience. So when Daryl sits across the table from a Roger Kelly or anyone else who's big in the white supremacy movements or the KKK, his first step is to just get curious about that other person a genuine desire to understand that person's worldview, how they got there. 
before trying to dismantle arguments or prove them wrong. He leads with curiosity, not with, I'm right, you're wrong. The second thing that I've seen him do, and sometimes these happen chronologically, but other times, like, you know, they're out of order. So don't think that this is like something that's chronological. These are just things that I've outlined from what I've seen him do effectively. The second thing I've seen is he establishes common ground with that other person. If you watch his documentary, and I'll link the documentary because the name of it is, uh, is escaping me right now. But if you watch his documentary and how he speaks to some of these adversaries, you know, he'll get confrontational with them, but then like he'll take a, like a 90 degree turn and then talk about music or talk about history, whether it's KKK history or something else that the other person is disarmed and kind of like steps into the middle of the arena without like the, the, you know, the, the swords drawn. And you can hear that person starting to engage in something other than an argument. And when Daryl finds that common ground, whether it's through again, music or trivia or something like you can already start to see that that person is a little bit bewildered because they've dropped their argument. And there's like almost a joy or an interest in talking with this human being that at least at, at certain points in time, these white supremacists don't even see Daryl as a human being. But all of a sudden now they've humanized him. And Daryl does this common ground thing over the course of time where they start to experience more of that and less of the other, less of the distancing. So where can you find the common ground? The third thing he does is that he brings compassion. Like Daryl truly brings compassion to a person that you would argue deserves no compassion, right? Because these are people who have, who lead with hatred. And yet Daryl gets underneath the hood of this person's life, finds out how they grew up, where they learned their ideology, what were the events of their early years that caused them to take the turns that they did. And just through this inquiry alone, without judgment, you know, Daryl's just listening, asking, listening, asking, the person sitting on the other side of the table all of a sudden feels like a, like a unconscious sense of respect, right? That this man is asking me enough questions. Like he's just curious about hell. My, my KKK members don't ask me these level of questions. They don't sit there with this level of interest. Why is this man showing me this level of interest? It communicates an unconscious level of respect. That compassion is felt. So even when they're feeling antagonized by some of Daryl's questions around their ideology, there's this underlying sense of respect. And Daryl's never the one who jumps up and gets away from the table first. He never walks away from the table. He actually stays there as uncomfortable as it may be. He waits for someone else to walk away and they do often, but he's committed to staying at that table because he's got compassion for that person. Even when he hears some of those vile revolting things directed at him. The fourth thing I see him do is he brings extraordinary knowledge to the table. Like Daryl knows more about the KKK and its history than most of its members. In the documentary, there's this like amazing story where one of Daryl's friends who is a KKK member who was up for a promotion was afraid to go for the promotion inside of the, whatever the clan, um, because he needed to take like a history test on the clan and he hadn't been brushing up on his studies. And he was afraid to ask his other KKK members for being exposed. And he goes to Daryl and tells him his fear and Daryl gave him like basically the history lesson and the guy ended up passing the test. Now you can argue whether or not that's a prudent thing to do, but what the interesting thing about that was when Daryl sits down across the table from his quote adversaries, he knows more or as much as the biggest experts in that space about their political structure, about their history, about their movement, about what they what they care about. It basically, it's, it's like if you were someone who listens to Fox News, it's like you would actually go and listen to CNN for a year <laughs> or vice versa. Instead of only exposing yourself to what you think is right and only consuming the information that is relevant to you, it's actually going and making the effort to understand what your adversary is listening to, watching, what belief systems they hold, what foundation it rests upon. And when Daryl's able to sit there intelligently and speak even more intelligently than most of the clan members about their history and the movement and the political structure and how they differ from state to state, then they look at him with a sense, again, of respect. This man 
respects what we are doing at least enough to educate himself on it versus burying his head in the sand. Like Daryl, when he speaks, there's not much that he says about the clan or others that's off base because he's got his thumb on the pulse. And then finally, the fifth step is he chips away at certainty. He constantly is chipping away at their certainty. Adversaries, his adversaries cling to their belief systems because they're certain that the belief system that they have is right. Right? Think about someone that you're arguing with or think about it when someone's arguing with you. Like you're, you're digging in because you're certain that you're right or that person is certain that they're right. But when Daryl can chip away at that certainty over the course of time, you know, as he learns more, as he questions more, he starts to place the seed of doubt in their minds. When he shows compassion, when he shows how much knowledge he has about the KKK, it chips away the certainty in their mind that he's less than a human being, that he's someone that deserves to be exterminated from the face of the earth. The fact that Daryl shows him more respect than most of his clan members, like it chips away at the certainty of the worldview. And over the course of time, that house of cards collapses. You know, and I think the thing that underpins everything here, like Daryl's ability to sit at the table and to take the berating, to take the horrifying things that are said to him, to take the lack of respect, to take the anger and the frustration and the hatred. The reason why he's able to do that is because Daryl has the ace in the hole. And the ace in the hole is he knows that he comes from a place of love. That if you are going to dig down deep enough, if you're going to get to the bottom of every single question and the root of where we all come from is a place of sameness, a place of love. And that he knows that if he stays at the table long enough and if these guys will stay at the table long enough with him, that they'll eventually be able to see that. So I think about when I'm talking with adversaries and I, and I use that term loosely because I don't look at my life as I don't walk around looking at people as adversaries. Um, I think I use that term. I know I use that term because I know that many of our, the people who I speak to believe that they have adversaries in their life. And I think it was a tangible way to sink your teeth into this conversation. But when I look at someone else who just doesn't hold the same opinion as me, and I like I'm on group text messages now with old college fraternity brothers who are, you know, who, who have very different viewpoints about what's going on in this world than I do. And I've had some visceral reactions and feelings that have made me want to cut ties, that have made me want to scream and argue, but then I'm not doing anything to change the narrative. I'm not doing anything to heal. The reason why these guys are so passionate about what they believe in is because they've had a series of life events that have led them here that I know nothing about. Now I can choose to invest my energy in figuring that out and sitting at the table the way that Daryl Davis has. And I believe that a part of my research and a part of my work is absolutely calling me to do that because the work that I see myself doing here on the show and the same thing with Brian is we don't need more people yelling at each other, arguing at each other, trying to defeat one another, right? Because that's the game that most people play is when I'm right, you're wrong. It's a zero sum game. I'm trying to defeat you. Instead, what I believe a super skill of the future, like I believe if I'm looking at as Brad Barrett from Choose If I says, you know, looking at a thousand year timeline, I think he got that from Simon Sinek, but looking at it a thousand years, like a thousand years from now, I would hope that when people sit down over a disagreement, it's not that I'm going to obliterate you. It's I'm going to try and understand you. And if I'm coming from a different place, I would like for the both of us to get to an understanding that's even better than what we would have wanted individually on our own. And the way to do that is to sit down at the table the same way that Daryl Davis has and to start to, start to show our, quote, adversaries some respect. So again, in summary, here are the five steps that Daryl uses to help change his adversary's mind. Number one is curiosity, leading with curiosity instead of I'm going to prove you wrong or expose you or show you how your worldview is off. Number two, he looks for common ground constantly looking for ways to diffuse the tension and showing that we aren't so different after all. Number three, he holds a compassion for that other person. He doesn't have to like how they're behaving or treating him, but recognizing that those behaviors are the sum result, right? They're the summation of 
his enti- that person's entire life's worth of life experiences. And chances are, if that person is vile and wretched in what they're saying or doing, that they've experienced that in their lives, that that was brought to them in their lives. That's why they've turned out this way. So there's an ability to hold compassion, which allows him to hang in there versus ejecting. Number four, he is knowledgeable about what's important and crucial to the person that he's arguing with because that shows a sense of respect, but it also allows him to have much more intelligent conversations when that person resists. And then finally, he continues to chip away at their sense of certainty because and when a person is certain about their belief system or their point of view, then it's really hard to move them off of that. But over the course of time, if you chip away at certainty, they become open-minded to other possibilities. And when they're open to other possibilities, then there's the opportunity for change. Hey, if you ended up using any of these steps in some of the conversations in your life that are more challenging and you experienced results, please share your story with me at dominic at dominicq.com or go to doinnerwork.com and send me a note. I'd love to hear your success stories of putting this work into action. So please email me at dominic at dominicq.com doinnerwork.com, and you may hear your story shared on one of these episodes in the future.